this time. Good morning. Good morning. Let me welcome you to the spring conference organized by the Global Supply Chain Management Initiative. And you would have noticed that this year, the spring conference is really in the spring. Normally we have it during the February, but this year we decided that we are going to have it in the spring. Um, so let me first thank our sponsors. So I'm very grateful that we have American Axel, ArcelorMittal, and General Motors sponsoring. Being the partners of the center, it helps us a lot and uh, allows us to organize events like this. And I also would like to acknowledge Boeing, Caterpillar, Cyber, John Deere, and USS for sponsoring this event. So I'm very thankful for that. And I'm also very thankful for you showing up. And hopefully we have a lot of things to share, apart from the presentation, discussions, as well as networking and talking and finding about each other and learning from each other as well as hopefully having partnership as we go along for the future years. Uh, I particularly would like to thank Andrea and Valinda. Uh, unfortunately, I was hoping that they will be here, so when I introduced that you could meet with them or see them, because Andrea is our new uh, Assistant Managing Director for the Center, and Valinda has been with us and she has been, both of them have been very helpful. And also I would like to acknowledge our center GAs, as well as a lot of volunteers which m make it possible. Because I know that in the, few, in the past I have come and attended these conferences and I didn't realize how much effort that goes in to organizing an event like this. It's, it's a lot. I mean, even the questions or things that Andrea comes asking me to make decisions about, I find it as taxing. So when I think about what they go through having to do everything, it's amazing. But what I also like to recognize at this point is that a lot of the system that has been set up by Anand Thayer and Mary Pillard helped us a lot. So they paved the way to have something going smooth, reduce the amount of agony that we have to go through, but at the same time, it's a lot of work. So I, I hope that you'll give a hand of applause to Andrea and Melinda and everybody else that contributed to organizing this conference. <laughs> so the theme of the conference is flexibility. And we chose this. Uh, because most of the time when you think about flexibility, the question goes back to uh, evolution. Most of the time, people would say that it is the survival of the fittest. But everybody now agrees that it is not the fittest who survives. It's the one that who is most flexible that survives. And when you think about supply chain management, the flexi flexibility is becoming more and more an essential requirement that we have to pay attention to. Oh, by the way, Andrea is there. So, Andrea, please come forward. And... So, the theme is interesting, and I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. And I, when I look at it, when I was talking to different companies, we did a survey, and the survey clearly came out that everybody seems to be interested in flexibility. It's an important topic. The flexibility could be focused on something that is short term or something that you are worried about going into a country, setting up a plant, and then asking yourself, what if I have to pack up the plant and leave to another country? So the degree of flexibility you need and the issues that you might face can be very varied. And so I'm very looking forward to listening and learning from the speakers. So, the panel one is going to consist of three speakers from Coca-Cola, Caterpillar, and Wipro. And we will, after, 
for the, we will give the time for the speaker to give the presentation. And end of this panel, we will have 20 minutes of question and answers. Okay. So uh, hold on the questions, unless it's something that you need to clarify immediately. Please hold on the question until we start the quick Q&A. So our lead presenter is Gary Smith from Caterpillar. G Gary, let me get his, you can, you can read as well as let me say, Gary is responsible for leading all supply chain activities, including strategic process transformation, supply chain planning, material requirements management, inventory management, demand and order management, supply chain performance and logistics, and ensuring linkage between process planning and execution. And my OM and supply chain students would immediately recognize that everything that they need to learn, we have somebody who has experience, and I'm very, very happy to welcome Gary to give us the presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. And uh, first of all, I'd like to also uh, commend the, the group that was helping doing the organization of the event. Um, from a speaker standpoint, they were outstanding, uh, with, you know, keeping us on track and what we needed to provide and the dates and so forth. The communication was excellent, so thank you for that. Um, the topic, obviously, of flexibility, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, what we're going to, the way we're going to, I'm going to try to approach it is give you a little bit of background of what Caterpillar is about, what we, what our environment is like, uh, what's our company about, to give you a little bit of a sense of the, the challenges that, that we face as, as a global company, a global manufacturing company. And then we'll get into a little bit about what flexibility means to us, some of the challenges we have, because as was mentioned earlier, the range of, of challenges that you, you uh, experience as a supply chain uh, manager or uh, a manufacturer in the world is, is quite varied and can in the, the various it can have various impacts and various uh, levels of, uh, of opportunity there uh, so then we'll get into a little bit about what that means to us and then how we approach it at Caterpillar first of all standard uh, dis <laughs> kind of disclosure there that uh, there may be some f uh, forward-looking statements here so they may or may not uh, match actual results as we go forward, but uh, this is in your packet. You can read the fine print. Um, first of all, this is our chairman, uh, Doug Oberhelman. Uh, he's the chairman and CEO. He's been uh, in, the, in the helm for about three years now, I believe, and you can uh, see some of the words that he uses there, and, that, and, and it's kind of a mantra for our, our company. We make uh, sustainable progress possible. And it's really kind of what we, we really see ourselves doing. Um, wherever you see uh, a need for infrastructure, uh, mining, energy, any of those things that uh, that's going on anywhere in the world, we're there. And we're going to uh, there to understand our customers and, and try to satisfy their needs. Um, so we're, we make it possible around the world every day, uh, building the world's infrastructure. Our, our engines, which is uh, important to us here in Lafayette, because our uh, Gary Bear and I are from the Lafayette engine plant here in town, and we make uh, Caterpillar's largest engines, um, and we we serve um, multiple markets from uh, electric power to petroleum, uh, rail, marine, all kinds of different applications. Um, so it is a big part of our business and uh, for Caterpillar, and it's obviously very important to us here locally, uh, making uh, solutions. Uh, providing solutions to our customers to make them successful. And that's really how we approach uh, business and our customer. And that if they're successful, then we can be successful. So we try to understand their business and try to make them as successful as possible. And we are a world leader. In all the markets that we serve, we're either number one or number two in every, in every segment. So when we go in, we go in to compete. We go in to satisfy the customer base and to, and to lead, the, uh, lead the market. A little bit of history, again, uh, a little background on what Caterpillar is about. We started in 1925 with a merger of the Holton Best Company. Uh, we started out a $13.8 million company in 1925, and you can see the progress going forward and some of the things that, that we've been involved in. Um, first diesel track type tractor, um, a rapid global expansion in the 60s and 70s. We were involved in World War II providing uh, equipment at that, for that uh, endeavor. Factory modernization program, we called it the Plant with the Future program uh, in the 1980s. 
when we were getting an onslaught of competition from, from abroad, uh, we made the decision to go and spend um, a couple billion dollars to modernize our factories during that time. Um, we're, sustainability is a big thing uh, within, uh, within Caterpillar. We make sustainable progress possible, so it's a very environmentally focused um, mission as well. And you can see the growth of the company. Uh, in, 70, uh, in the late 60s, we, we broke a uh, billion dollars in sales. Uh, 1970, we're at 2.1. You can see the growth from there, 8.6. Uh, from 1990 to 2000, we essentially doubled. From 2000 to 2010, we doubled again. And then you can see the growth from uh, over the last year as we come out of the trough. So uh, another, uh, this kind of gives you an indication of the growth that we're seeing in, in the markets that, that we serve. <coughs> Um, this is a, kind of a pictorial of some of the products that we, uh, that we provide. Uh, a lot of people know Caterpillar as the, the world's largest construction and mining equipment uh, company, which we are. We're also uh, very heavy into you know, electric power and um, providing you know, diesel engine solutions as well. We're a world leader in the large en engine segment, and we also are very much focused on providing uh, solutions for our customers and making sure that we service the product once it hits the field. Global reach, we are a global company. Um, we, global reach is really unmatched in the industry. We serve uh, customers in more than 180 countries around the world. Basically, there's very few countries that we don't do business. Any, uh, one of the uh, uh, sayings or the, another mantra that we have within our, our company is that it's always time to go to work. And that's uh, even more than just normal management supervisors speak, that it's always time for you to go to work. What it's really uh, uh, leading to or uh, referencing is that every hour of every day, somewhere around the world, we have a customer that's going to work with our equipment, and we've got to be there to support them and, and, and make them successful. More than half our sales are outside the United States. We have over 500 locations worldwide uh, when you include the manufacturing, the marketing, logistics, R&D, and service uh, type of uh, uh, locations, facilities, and you can kind of see where we're scattered out around the world. We depend on exports. Uh, this uh, kind of is an indication of our, from 2010, uh, we had over $13 billion that, that we exported from the U.S. to various places around the world. And you can see we're, we're pretty diverse relative to the regions of the world that we service. Um, and, uh, and you can kind of see the, the magnitude of those numbers. So this just creates some additional challenges when we're talking about flexibility and being able to design logistics plans and, and support uh, strategies to be able to support this equipment once it gets out into the field and also get it to the customer um, in some of the most remote regions of the world um, so that they can they can put it to work and, and, and run their business successfully. <clears throat> Why is it important that we are that, that companies focus globally? 95% um, of the world's consumers are located out of uh, outside of the US so there's a big population there and it's a big market a lot of uh, growth, as we all know, uh, in all different areas of the world. So you, if, if you really want to grow, you can't just put your blinders on and, uh, and focus on simply the U.S. market. Another, another uh, demographic thing that's, uh, that's affecting all of us uh, and, and the, the markets out there that we serve, uh, in 2006, for the first time, more than half the world's inhabitants were considered middle class. You can kind of see the growth there. It went from about 25% in the 1960s and kind of steadily growing to where in uh, 2006 we, we broke across the 50% barrier. What that means is that um, the, the other, all, all, all other areas of the world are, are becoming more uh, wealthy and more uh, um, developed. And with that, they need uh, infrastructure, they need power, they need, we need minerals and for mining and so forth. And, uh, and all that is, is driving increased demand on our particular product. Another demographic shift that's happening is that if you look at the middle class, uh, although uh, 3.3 billion in the total population, there's been a shift. If you look at the West versus Asia, um, they've been relatively flat over, um, over several years, several decades really, uh, but there's been the growth that has driven this metric has been in the Asia region. So again, there's some challenges that that, that drives from a supply chain manufacturing uh, perspective. So, what, so that's a little bit of a background on what Caterpillar is about and some of the challenges that we have as a global company. Um, but what is flexibility? Uh, there's lots of definitions of that. There's lots of ways you can look at that. Um, we look at it 
uh, from a standpoint of a kind of a couple things, but all relative to response time. How, what is our response time to changes or disruptions? So you can, in, in relative to changes, what we're really talking about is demand changes, mix changes, customer changes. There's just any kinds of things that can hit your supply chain, your manufacturing operation, and so forth. You, you can look at for demand changes, for example. Um, what would happen, how, how do you respond as a company or as a, as a particular facility, if you're, in our case, we're responsible for a particular facility, if demand, for example, drops off 70% virtually overnight? What happens if the demand increases then, uh, doubles in, in, a, in over a one year period of time, and then maybe doubles again right after that? You may think, well, that, that's silly, that's kind of academic ex exercise that never happened. But between the end of 2008 and end of 2011, that's exactly what happened. Uh, we dropped off, fell off the cliff during the downturn. Our volumes went away quickly. We had to respond to that in order to, uh, to survive. And um, then when it came back, we had to be ready to service our customer and make sure that we were there for their product uh, that, that they demanded. That creates quite a bit of a challenge. And it is, uh, it is their very survival that you've got to be able to respond to that. We learned that. Uh, very, very difficult lesson in uh, late 2008 and 2009, that if you cannot respond to that type of a, of a downturn and get, uh, you know, getting inventory out of your system so that you can get cash, uh, so you can, you can literally survive as a company, uh, you're going to have some problems. So you can't cover problems in the supply chain with inventory. It's one of the messages that, uh, that we all learned very, uh, some of us very difficultly, uh, in a very difficult manner. In, um, in late 2008, 2009, mixed changes. We service, um, like I said earlier, we service electric power, we service petroleum, we service marine, we service uh, our own captive engines or uh, captive vehicles. What happens if that mix changes? What happens if, for example, the dot-com um, bubble, which we were supplying huge numbers of uh, <coughs> gym sets and packages to, if that demand goes away and maybe the shift goes into a petroleum market? Um, we've got to be able to respond to that. And for our particular product, um, the engine manufacturer, uh, you may think, well, it's just an engine, is an engine, is an engine. But we have literally hundreds of different configurations and really different thousands of different, depending on the different combinations that you have, um, that, that our customer can order. Uh, so you've got to be able to uh, uh, respond depending on what customer w wherever in the world um, has a demand and what they, what they need. Customer changes for, is another thing um, that, that can uh, drive um, you know, different, different needs for flexibility. They may come to you and order one thing, realize later they need something else. You've got to be able to respond to that. Disruptions, they can be man-made or natural. Um, you could have a strike somewhere in, uh, in Brazil that can impact your supply chain. Uh, you could have a, uh, have a natural disaster, a tsunami that hits a major uh, area of the world. Uh, and wipes out the manufacturing base or your supply base. How do you respond to that? So all these different things really drive the need for flexibility within your, uh, your our organizations. We kind of grouped it in, in kind of two, kind of in a matrix form, I guess. There's internal and there's external, and there's there's low impact and kind of high impact. There's different degrees in which you um, you have to re respond. It, these can move in different directions. These are kind of just examples of you know, what what we really are looking for looking at there. You know, if the part doesn't show on time, that could be really internal or external, but if we lose the part or whatever, uh, it doesn't show up on the line when the assembler turns around and needs it, that's a problem. But typically, we, got, uh, we have responses in, in place that, um, and reactionary teams in place that we can uh, deal with that and, and get that corrected relatively quickly to minimize the impact. You know, a customer may need a product sooner within, than what our standard lead times are. Again, we're focused on the customer. We're trying to make them successful. We've got to respond to that because if we don't, somebody else will, and we're going to respond to the customer and, and make them <coughs> successful. You could also have um, an internal high-impact thing. For example, if you decide that you want to go into a, a different country and you want to make, um, make a real push into China, for example, uh, that drives a lot of different changes and lots of needs for flexibility and, and uh, planning as you go in to uh, make those types of decisions. Customer demand drops, natural disaster hits the supply base, uh, or new government regulations, which, which happens quite often, whether it's on emission regulations or whatever that may be. You've got to be able to respond to that. Your very survival really depends on that. Um, 
there's some also some fundamental changes or challenges that are inherent, especially with a global company that uh, and and some of these decisions also drive. Um, you know, longer supply chain. We have manufacturing facilities all around the world, as you saw in the, the previous slide. Um, we also, uh, in conjunction with that, we source product, we source parts uh, for, our, for our product anywhere in the world. So we may have, a, uh, and with that uh, comes risk because you have a longer supply chain and, and, and longer uh, value chain that where various things can go wrong. So all that introduces additional risk that you've got to be able to plan for. Um, You've got to be closer to the customer, so we, that drives you to put manufacturing facilities in different parts of the world. And with that, there's different regulations, customers' infrastructure. For example, how do you import product into China? It's not the, you don't have the same regulations that maybe we're used to in, in different areas of the world. Different constraints there. Uh, you've got to understand those, and you've got to be able to adapt to those. Um, cash flow, you can't cover uh, <coughs> problems with inventory where we hit that. And then uh, there's multiple demand streams, multiple uh, uh, shifts in the in markets that you serve and, uh, and the challenges that that, um, that brings as well. Our goal uh, within, um, with our supply chain organization is really to, to plan uh, to move from as much of, of these challenges that we have and possible failure modes, if you will, from being a reactionary mode into more of a planned response if, if things happen. So there's some tools that we use to do that. One is the process FMEA and the business risk management tools. Um, and what we're really looking at there, you can look at that different ways. You look at your entire, um, at a macro level, your entire supply chain and, and look at it from a standpoint of what could go wrong. What, what are the likely things that could happen? What, where are we clustered? Where's our supply base clustered? Are we uh, clustered next to a coast? Are we clustered next to a, uh, an earthquake fault line, for example? Uh, or where are we in this unstable region of the world? So what could go wrong within that supply base that, that could drive disruption that we need to respond to? So within the process FMA, you look at those potential failure modes and you look at the likelihood of that happening. You kind of measure that and gauge that. Uh, the higher the likelihood, the, you know, obviously the higher the risk. What's the impact if that happens? Is, is it going to shut you down or is it just going to be a minor inconvenience? And then your ability to detect that. So visibility to these problems when they arise is, is a key element. Can we, will we know that there's going to be a, um, you know, a strike somewhere in the world? Will we be able to tell <coughs> what product that we've got impacted by that? So visibility and ability to detect is a key element of our, of our planning and our analysis. So looking at a macro level, you know, you look at those different, different elements of your, your total supply chain and you assess that and, and do a risk assessment of, of those, uh, those attributes. And then you look at what can we do to mitigate that? What can we do to get more visibility? What can we do to uh, maybe have supply bases that, that's not all clustered around one particular geographical region, for example? Um, and then you try to drive that, that risk down. And you plan for the things that could happen because you've already done some analysis ahead of time. So process improvements and controls are this to address potential uh, high process uh, impacts or disruptions. This is kind of graphically, if you want to look at likelihood versus potential impact, again, there's various <coughs> ranges of things that can happen, um, and your response you know, can be different. It, it, again, the goal is to drive this down so that either the likelihood goes down or the potential impact goes down, or our ability to detect if there's a third axis there is increased so that when something does go wrong, we get visibility to it as early as we can in the process so that we can respond to it. One way you can do that is having relationships with your supplier um, and daily communications with them so that they have a machine that goes down or they have a supply that one of their suppliers um, is disrupted and they can't get raw material in. You get visibility of that very, very quickly early in the process so that you, then you can react to it. You can plan, work together with your process partner to uh, minimize the impact. So those are the kind of the things that, that we're really looking at. So within, you can look at it at a macro level, but you can also, as you're designing your value chain for a, for a particular supplier, look at, do a process FMEA on that as well and analyze for that particular supplier what, what can go wrong. For our, um, you know, key component suppliers, it's not good enough for us to just uh, treat that as a black box where we put a purchase order in and then uh, 
part comes out at the other end. We got to have the, an understanding of what that supplier's process is. We need to know their constraints. We need to know their lead times for their supply base so that we can work best together to make sure that we keep the supply coming out. So uh, it's really understanding and communication within uh, within that uh, that area. Um, from a flexibility standpoint, there's, there's again there's various controls that we have in place. Um, we have material analysts that um, kind of deal with day-to-day -day responses. They're on the phone with, uh, you, they may have 50 suppliers that they're responsible for. They're on the phone, they, re, they we get a daily update of what, where they ship to the schedule or not, and then we're, we're reacting to that. The kind of the next layer up is if, if we have somewhere, we have a chronic problem uh, or something that looks like it's appearing to develop into a, a chronic problem, we utilize what we're calling supply chain performance engineers. And what they're looking at is more found fundamental, higher impact problems. So the material analyst may say, hey, I've got this problem. The supplier isn't shipping and has been missing uh, scheduled over the last five days. Hey, I need some help. The supply chain performance engineer gets in and understands their processes and works with them and says, hey, what's the problem? Let's get to the root cause of this and let's get some solutions. So that's kind of the next layer up. Um, and then from you know there, we have some also some other things that we, we also um, design into our, our processes that, that help with flexibility. Communication we already hit on. We have monthly teleconference with our entire supply base on what we've got upcoming, what we see on the, the horizon, what's our market shifts and so forth. We uh, are also utilizing transportation control towers so that um, within Caterpillar, we have products moving everywhere in the world all the time. Uh, and we have visibility uh, to that product moving and where it's at, what ship it's on, what container it's on within that ship. So if we have a disruption um, where a ship has to return to port because of whatever reason, some mechanical failure, we know what, what our potential impact is. We start planning for, do we need to expedite material? What do we have to do to, to respond to that? Again, kind of a planning up front, give visibility as soon as we can, and then we know how to react. Strategic buffers, inventory can't cover things, but you can't, you've got to protect your, your customer as well. So where we have chronic problems, we, we look at strategic buffering uh, on, on individual cases. Um, when we do have issues, for example, when a tsunami hits, uh, hits uh, the coast of Japan, um, we, we as a company look at what demand does all of our facilities have in that area, where, where's our risk at, where's our line down base for all the different facilities, and we coordinate a one voice to that supplier so that they're not having five different facilities calling them, and we're, um, we're more coordinating on what is the real priority for Caterpillar. Uh, not just for, for example, Lafayette. Uh, external, uh, knowing your customers. We're getting very, very close to our customers. Our, our CEO visits at least one customer a week um, and, uh, and talks to various others, and also suppliers as well, um, which is quite a commitment uh, from the standpoint of a, of a CEO making sure that they get it, he gets out to the remote areas of the world to be able to, to know what our customers are, are about. Understand their needs, uh, anticipating their needs. <coughs> Strategic suppliers, understanding, getting that relationship, that communication, uh, so that you can work together as process partners whenever uh, problems arise. Um, uh, understanding the lead time, understanding those those suppliers, understanding their processes, so it's not just a black box that you're you're reacting to, and then designing that, and understanding that value chain to make sure that that we are able to meet our needs. We kind of start at the, the tail end where we're, what's our customer's demand from us? We design the value chain and the supply chain to be able to meet that. Uh, whatever that response time is that our customers are expecting to us, from us, we've got to be able to meet that. And we design the, the value chain to be able to do that. Dual source, if necessary, it's not a, a big initiative for us, to be honest with you. Um, but in occasion, we do do that because we're, we're more into the strategic relationship that we, uh, we're building with our supply base. Being involved in public policy discussions, that can, that's an impact to your, co your company. You've got to know what's out there. You've got to know what could potentially impact you, and you've got to be actively involved in that. Um, our, our CEO was actively involved in the public debate. Uh, you may have seen him on different uh, business uh, uh, stations or channels or whatever, programs, where um, you know, he's actively engaged in, in the public policy debate. This being an election year in the U.S., uh, it's obviously something that we've got to be very much in tune to. 
<coughs> so just basically in summary, what we, again, we're trying to, to move from just reactionary to a plan mode, and we do that by planning up front and analyzing the value chain up front with these process FMEA <coughs> and lessen the number of things that are not planned for, not anticipated. Um, communication and visibility is key. We've got to be able to know things, and it goes into the detect mode within the FMEA. Can we see that the problem is happening before it happens, before we're lying down and then we're scrambling? So, and part of that is strategic suppliers having a good relationship there, uh, knowing our customers, knowing that there may be a market change uh, before it happens, anticipating that so that we can plan for that. Um, and then having the, the resources to respond to the, 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 the fundamental issues that happen. Um, and then win-win relationships with the stakeholders. They, they've got to know, you've got to work with your suppliers uh, to get that relationship so that we have, um, it's not just Big Brother Cat pushing them around, it's about let's do this together. Uh, business is good for, for all of us, as, our, as Gary is, uh, points out to our suppliers regularly. So let's all, let's get it, get it done together so that we can capture, uh, you know, capture the market. That was pretty well it. Um, I don't know if there's any quick questions or... No. Okay.